Welcome back, everybody, for this bonus episode of Drunk Bible Study. So we each have some things that we've looked up for this one. And I guess I will start us out by talking about this mystical book of the wars of Yahweh. Yeah. <laughs> What's that Yeah, tie-in? did you actually find anything about that? Yeah. So actually, it's super okay. cool. So um, the book of the wars of the Lord um, is... The Lord! The Lord. Um, so this is one of several non-canonical books referenced in the Bible. So essentially, like, they're books that are referenced in the Bible, but that are not part of the Bible, right? It's not like, like there's a lot of times in the Bible where they'll reference other books from the Bible, but these are examples of non-canonical books, right? So things outside of the Bible, which are referenced, which there's a bunch of actually throughout the Bible. Um, And this is one of the ones that's been completely lost. Wow. Um, Okay. Yeah. So this one is only mentioned specifically by name in this section of numbers that we just wrote. But there's actually another book that is mentioned, which is called the Book of Jasher, or Jasher, Jasher, J A S H E R, the Book Jasher. of Jasher, Jasher, um, which some some people believe that this Book of the Wars of the Lord might be the same book as the Book of Jasher, I see. Um, okay. potentially, but although that's not not super clear. Um, the book of Jasher is believed to be a collaborative record collectively written by Moses, Joshua, and the children of Israel. So like, yeah. <laughs> and everybody else. <laughs> all, all y'all. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but what's kind of cool about this is, so then I looked up like, well, what are these non-canonical books referenced in the Bible? And there's a bunch of them in the Old Testament, but actually this book of Jasher gets mentioned in the New Testament as well. Interesting. So if it is connected really? to that, that's kind of cool. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, but there's just, there's a bunch of these and they've got cool names like the manner of the kingdom. Oh, <laughs> Sounds How like, intriguing. A, like a romance okay. novel. Yeah. Or uh, the visions of Isaiah. Oh, geez. Or what, other things that this? seem like they could have been in the Bible, but just didn't survive or didn't make the cut or something. And some of them are considered part of the Deuterocanon, which is... Okay, or, or like Deuteronomy? No, oh. same root word. So the Deuterocanon is what some Christians would call the Apocrypha, which is like okay. Christian writings that are not part of the Bible and are like either not legit according to some sources or other sources are like, no, they're legit too. They're just not part of the Bible. And so the Deut- okay. the Deutera canon is like the companion canon. It's kind of what that's about. I see. Um, but what's interesting is in the Deutera canon is actually one of Aesop's fables. It's part of uh, the Deutera oh, canon. Oh, which one? Uh, the, Wait, it, from that long ago? The, the two pots. That classic Aesop's fable that we all learned. Or I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. That's not. It's it's that it's mentioned in the Deuterocanon. Sorry, oh, it's not part okay. of the Deuterocanon. Sorry, I misread that at first. Uh, but yeah, that in the Book of Sirach, which is part of the Deuterocanon. Okay, Sirah, Sirah. Yep. Uh, that that the that Aesop's fable is mentioned, um, and that there's other times, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, where um, even like popular writings of the time are referenced. Which is I feel of, like Aesop. I always thought Aesop's fable was like written like in the 1800s or something. No, those are old. No, they're legit. They're, Aesop's really they're old. They're that old? Yeah. I mean, what? I, I mean, I could probably look it up real quick right now and tell you when it's supposed to be written. Uh, 620 and 564 BC. What? What? Yeah. So, still, That's, I mean, a while after where we are right now. That's like. 700 several, years. Yeah, several after hundreds of years. Where we Be are that right as now. it may, goodness. Yeah. That's anyway, incredible. I, I thought all this was super cool, just kind of seeing like what all these things. There's so this book of Jasher that, that the book of the Wars of the Lord might be part of. There was a book that was released that claimed to be a translation of the book of Jasher that was later determined by Hebrew scholars to be a load of, of, Bull poop? Of bull poop. Whoa. Of hogwash. Bull poop. Yeah, that just, it claimed to be that uh, and just wasn't at all. Wow. So, so yeah, that's also interesting. 
Wow. Well, that's okay. that's what I got for you about the Book of the Wars of cool. Yahweh. Cool. What you got, Emily? All right. Uh, I have some stuff about God's special boy, Balaam. <laughs> <laughs> Balaam, uh-huh. whose name I could never pronounce. Apparently, okay, he's a a diviner in the Torah, and he's kind of like a, a pro. He's a prophet for sure. Like clearly, he's a prophet. Well, clearly, so, he's okay. you know he's in with Yahweh in some kind of regard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. So he's definitely a non-Israelite, but he's the son of Baor, though right. Baor is not clearly identified. Though some sources may only describe the positive blessings he delivers upon the Israelites, he is revealed, reviled, 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 hated as a wicked man in both the Torah and in the New Testament. So Balaam refused to speak what God did not speak and would Mm. not curse the Israelites, even though King Balak of Moab offered him money to do so. So that's so interesting. Seems like and then, an all right dude, by yeah, Yahweh's well, standards at least. There's more stuff that I'm not going to read, and I already like freaking spoiled myself. Oh, you got myself. some spoilers. Oh, no. Yes, I did, and I was sad about it. I said There was even something in here about revelations, and oh. I was like, whoa. whoa, we're not even close to that. <laughs> not anywhere not even close. Not remotely. But yeah, wow. anyways. But it sounds like, yeah, it's it's interesting. So let's see. Um, yeah, so he can only do what Yahweh commands. And God has, via a nocturnal dream, told uh, him not to go? Told him not to go where? Yeah, so this, is, this is the stuff we just read. Go. Well, but, yeah. but you're saying that some texts say that, that Yahweh told him not to go when... Yeah. Well, I guess Yahweh told him not to go first and then later was like, I mean, whatever, do what you want. Well, yeah, so God permits him to go finally, but with instructions to say only what he commands. Right. So yeah, that's what Balaam we just read. sits out, yeah, does the donkey thing. Balaam is finally allowed to see the angel who invoke informs him that the donkey's turning away is the only reason reason the angel did not kill him. So yeah, that's interesting. Um and then later on, this is stuff that I am not supposed to know about. So yeah. I didn't realize all this, but yeah, he's but he's gonna make some prophecies in like the next oh. chapter. Oh, okay, all right. So we won't delve then, into like, that too deeply. Subs, yeah, and then subsequent chapters. So I'm assuming we'll be delving more into him later on. But yeah, he is apparently represented as one of the seven genteel prophets in rabbinic literature. Huh. So that's Gen- cool. Genteel- Job is one of them. Oh. And then also I guess Job's Job four was not, friends. Because Job was not, was not an Israelite. Is that what that means? A Gentile, I, not Gentile. I don't know. Gentile it says ge- Gentile. G- Gentile. Okay. Gentile. Did you so really call Bayor, it Gentile? She called it Gentile, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. What? I How don't know. How would you know that if you didn't know That's Gentile? True. That's true. Yeah. That's true. That's true. That's fair. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the other six are Bayor, Job, and Job's four friends. Wait, oh, Job's cool. four friends count as prophets too? Wow. I, I guess so. So okay, that's quite a consolation prize. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. So Balaam gradually acquired a position among the non-Jews, which was exalted as much as that of Moses among the Jews. Oh, at, wow! At first, being a mere interpreter of dreams, but later becoming a magician. <laughs> until great finally, magician. the spirit of prophecy des- descended upon him. Wow. Maybe he maybe he learned how to make donkeys talk just in general, and then was going around doing party tricks and became very popular right. in that way. Maybe he was just a ventriloquist. Possibly, <laughs> Maybe that's yeah. all it was. Yeah, wow. Okay, well, anyways, that's... I, I have a feeling... I mean, obviously, we're definitely going to hear more of him, but I, I have a feeling that I'm going to delve back into the Wikipedia Balaam article later on. Yeah, I can't really, likely. Yeah. I can't read a lot of this because I'm going to spoil myself. Sure. So, here we yeah. go. Okay, well, anyways. do y'all want to... Can I just give you one other fun little fact? That um, according to... Al Talabi, who was an 11th century Islamic scholar, uh, he believes that Balaam was a descendant of Lot, actually. Hmm. Oh, which uh, is I wonder how he put that together. I don't know. I'm Salem's curious. Lot. Unless it was like a weird fan theory that he was came Lot up with. <laughs> Maybe, was Lot a know. bad guy? Was Lot the guy who was the bad uh, vampire guy? No, no that, that was Cain. 
No, Lot is. <laughs> I like that we're like, yeah, yeah. Those vampires in the Bible. That was Cain. We're just like, yeah, what? that's Cain. I don't know. I'm no, sorry. I'm Emily, sorry. Emily. That makes as much sense to me as a lot of this does. Lot is the one who was in Sodom and Gomorrah. He welcomed the angels in. Oh yeah, he offered Lot's up his wife own, and he offered up his own virgin daughters for the she crowd back for one yes. freaking second. One freaking second, and then had sex with his own daughters in the mountains. So the yep. end. That's what happened. Lot's wife and a bunch of so yeah, maybe Balaam is descended from Lot and his daughters. Ew. Ew. Even Ew. worse. Okay, well, guess what? I got more grossness for you, oh, if good. you're ready. Oh, good. Ew. I love It's going to start out cool. It's going to be mostly kind of cool and interesting, and then it's going to end on a gross note. So Can prepare yourself. So during the episode, I was telling about my conversation with my coworker and, and talking to her about, uh-huh. about the Bible yeah. and yes. her, her daughter talking about Adam and Eve and whatever. Yes. And I was like, she's like, yeah, maybe my kids would be into that show. And I was like, yeah, totally. Like, we we keep the language fairly clean on this show. And I was like, but, I mean, the content comes from the Bible. So, like, it's <laughs> so, like, you may just you want know, to bear in mind that. your own risk. And she kind of gave me a blank stare because I don't. I got the impression she wasn't mm. soups familiar with. I see how what the Bible the really incredibly violent and traumatizing and, and, the Bible is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about serpents, shall we? Oh, yeah. And specifically right. serpents on poles. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, well, so here's the thing, though. The image of a serpent wrapped around a pole predates... Like a barber shop. Staff. Or, I mean, not, a, not a barber shop. Like a, <laughs> try again. Like the what? medical the medical. One. Yes, like the medical symbol. Okay, we're going to get oh, to that. Okay. So that is a symbol that predates the Israelites. There's uh-huh. evidence in ancient pre-Israelite Canaan of there being like serpent cults where they use similar symbols of serpents on staffs or wrapped around poles. Um, So later on in the Bible, this image of, okay, you can just go ahead and look it up yourself um, and you won't have to listen to me talk to you about it. Wow. (laughs) You can you can Sassy. take over if you want. Why don't you just keep talking for the people at home who are not looking at my screen <laughs> and seeing this medical symbol? Well, right how about now. you listen to me? I am listening. Okay. Anyway, later on in the Bible, it's going to go on to be called the Nehushtan, which is actually a derogatory term. Um, but once oh, we really? w- once we get there, you'll understand why. Um, okay. So, but for the purpose of this explanation, the symbol of Moses carrying the rod is the, the Nehushtan. Um, okay. Similar is the rod of Asclepius. That is what we see in the medical symbol, which is just a single rod with a single snake wrapped around it. That's from Greek mythology. Oh, well, hang on, I'm going to get no. there. So <laughs> uh-huh. everybody's just jumping okay. the freaking gun here. Well, we're um, really excited about this. <laughs> so, so it's a rod with one snake wrapped around it. That's the rod of Asclepius, attributed to the god Asclepius, who's a god of healing and doctoring and things like that. Um, the one that has two snakes and the wings—that's the Caduceus. Okay. Um, and that's also used by different that's used by different organizations because the caduceus is also associated with Hermes because it has the wings. And it tends to be associated with more commercial organizations as opposed to medical organizations oh. generally. Oh. Um okay. however, this is a symbol that has shown up in many, many different cultures at many, many different times, which is kind of funny and kind of spooky and a little weird. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, here comes the gross part. Okay. okay. Uh, uh. Oh, gosh. So, some people have theorized that this is a representation of the very ancient, yet still used to this day, method of treating guinea worm disease. I'm sorry, what What? what disease? What? Guinea worm disease. Like, that you get from guinea pigs? Nope. Did that you would get be much in more adorable. The land of Guinea. <laughs> no, so this is what Where Guinea worm disease from? is. Okay. New Guinea, and, and this is now this is the irony because this brings us back around to maybe an explanation of what the fiery serpents were. Okay, because okay, oh, oh, this, like is this is what is happens. Going. Guinea worms, they're from contaminated water from drinking contaminated water. Cool. The guinea worm larva gets into your system. They oh. hang out in your small intestine. <sighs> they mate. They uh-huh. reproduce. Yeah. They reach maturity. A pregnant female guinea worm will grow to three feet in length. Uh, Just like a tapeworm kind of situation? She will bore out of your small intestine. It's like, well, what? And she will make her way to your lower extremities. Lady. Hang on. No. I still got more to go. The guinea okay. worm will make its way to your lower extremities and will usually form a blister, often on people's feet or on their leg. Uh-huh. Now, when the blister forms, it's extremely painful, 
uh, an extremely painful burning sensation. Fiery. Yes. Yeah, so, surface. and this is this is very important. It burns, and so it prompts the host to dip the blister in water. And once the blister hits water, that's when the guinea worm bursts, releasing all of her larva back into uh, the water, so the cycle uh, can continue again. Okay, now, that is some biological warfare right now, there. Now, where wow. the snake on the pole comes in is that, to this day, there is still no cure for guinea worm disease. You know, there's, there's prevention of trying does to give it, people access to clean water and non-contaminated water and stuff like that. Where does this you? happen? Does it kill you or just make painful blisters? Really painful blisters. Okay. It so, kills you hang on, on sight, Jace, the, obviously. The, These people seem to die from it. It's really intensely painful and awful. Okay. okay. The oh, only God. way, the only cure once you have them is, like, once you get the blister, is you kind of stick a stick into the blister and you have to, like, slowly wrap the worm around the stick inch by inch over the course of several days and months. What, the, uh, what are you talking about? And that's about? how that's, that's, you remove it. <laughs> He's very from angry. Your body. I'm very oh, angry about it. I also this. forgot a part of the story is that, like, after you've ingested the larva, first part of the stage, it takes a year, a whole year before it matures and pops out of your foot. So they could be anywhere in us at this moment. But anyway, we could okay, have them on. right now. <laughs> if you drank some contaminated water uh, less than a year ago, probably. Um, probably. Here's God. the deal is they actually think. It's quite plausible that this was guinea worms because they were going through a drought. There was no water. That meant that the larva would have been concentrated in whatever water sources they had. Would have been easy for a lot of people to have gotten contaminated. Would have felt like fire. Would have been awful. Now, they now, think... How's this tied to the snake? Because that image of a snakish thing wrapped around the pole... Oh, I see. Right. That's you the twist image. It around the pole you twist it around the pole. And they it. think that that's this very, very old association with healing and with fixing you. Anyway, there's an hour, there's an hour very long, horrible. there's an hour long documentary called foul what? water slash fiery serpent. That is for free on YouTube. I'm a little scared to watch it. Just seeing some screenshots. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. it's very critically acclaimed. It's won a bunch of really, <laughs> it's won a bunch of awards, but like won the award for most grossest most snake based documentary. Well, okay. To make it serious, it is still a very serious problem in like sub Saharan Africa, Africa and like poorer parts of Southeast Asia and like places where access to clean water is a problem. Yeah. Um Jeez. so there is hope that we're a- we may be able within the next number of years be able to eradicate guinea worm disease from the planet, but it's still a thing. So now it's become a PSA. You're welcome. Yeah. Wow. We just Boy. delivered that. Dang. Is there, is there somewhere we can like donate to help eradicate guinea snakes? <laughs> guinea worms. worms. <laughs> the disease is guinea worm disease. Fire serpents. Fiery serpents. <laughs> There's something yeah. we can do about this. Because this is a horrible, horrible thing. That was a thing. lot. That was I a mean, lot. Yeah. if you look for guinea worm disease, you know, the first thing that pop up will be the CDC, you know, World Health Organization. Um, you can find plenty of... Uh, CarterCenter.org is an eradication program, specifically. So you can probably donate to them to help okay. with, uh, Boy, you know, wow. healing. So um, so that's that. Okay. Well. Uh-huh. Okay. Boy. <laughs> All right. Wow. Well, on that note, we hope that you all enjoyed <laughs> this episode of uh, Drunk Bible Study, the after show <laughs> slash the bonus episode um, where we talk about things like profits and what did you talk about, Jace? I don't know. Something. Oh, a book. A book. <laughs> yeah. It was not written in the Bible, but out of the Bible. And uh, guinea worm snakes and horrifying diseases. Yeah. Good well, times. Good times. <laughs> Yeah, good times indeed. Yeah, well, uh, I'm sure that we will have more fun things to throw at you next week. And until then, enjoy your week and we'll see you next time.